the whole subjects will change because of the question that you have used rather than a directive. Children uh, can learn things by themselves. A single child given a book or given the internet or given anything may or may not uh, learn just by himself or herself. They may understand certain things, they may not understand other things. What my work shows is that if you have a group of children clustered around a big screen with the internet so that they're searching together, then they can learn almost anything by themselves. At the time when I was doing these experiments in the 1990s, uh, in surgery, you know, where you, where, where you do surgical uh, operations, a new method had come up, which is often called keyhole surgery, which is you make a small hole and you put in some instruments through that and you do the surgery inside, you take out everything and you just close that small hole. It's called minimally invasive surgery. And people love it because, you know, they, you don't have to stay in hospital for months and all of that. So when I was doing the first of these children's education experiments, I thought to myself, well, this is learning happening just by itself. So why not call it minimally invasive education? Let's say that uh, you are a teacher, you are a geography teacher, and your subject that you have to teach is uh, volcanoes. So what happens in a traditional school? Children, today we are going to study about volcanoes. And everybody is, oh, why? <laughs> okay. Um, so that is maximally invasive. I'm going to cut open your brain and I'm going to put in volcano, all the material on volcanoes, and close it, end of matter. Suppose we change it to minimally invasive. So I walk into the classroom and I say, has anybody heard of volcanoes? So of course children, yeah, yeah. So what happens in a volcano? Oh, fire comes out and uh, so, you know, something very strange. The earth has many volcanoes, right? Yeah, I think so. So, why does it have volcanoes? Are volcanoes good for earth? Because if they are not good for the earth, if they are not good for people, why are they there? Now leave it. Everything you wanted to teach about volcanoes will happen in that classroom, minimally invasively, driven by this one question, you know. And uh, I have actually tried this out in England once, so I must tell you that it had a very funny ending. They found out everything about volcanoes, oh, pressure from inside and all. And then I said, but my question was, is it good or bad? I mean, why is it there in the first place? And you know what they said? They said, you know, when you eat something, you eat a lot, you have to burp. Ugh. Suppose you couldn't, if your mouth was held closed, would you like it? I said, no, so that's why we need volcanoes. <laughs> I always remember this, you know, volcanoes are the earth burping. <laughs> even if you want a child to learn something and he or she does not feel interested, then it is our job, the teacher's job, to make an interesting question, the answer to which will lead to whatever you want them to learn. We, we almost never do that. So we might say, in mathematics, you might say, you have to learn trigonometry. And the child says, Oh, it's very boring. Why? And if you are a bad teacher, you will say, you will understand later, but now you just study. That's the wrong way. The right way for this particular question would be, uh, have you uh, seen that on a mobile phone, if you uh, say my location, it tells you where you are or where the phone is. How does it know? Now you would get the child's imagination. And if he goes into the internet, he or she will immediately find trigonometry. I think we tend to overreact. Uh, particularly my generation. We tend to overreact because we never had any of this. 
and we look at it and say, oh my goodness, I mean, this is not how things should be and, and so on. But I can give you again a, a ridiculous example. Uh, you know, people say that children are getting addicted to their phones. So people are getting addicted to their phones. How would, I, how would it be if I were to say, you are addicted to your shoes? And you say, what does that mean? I say, can you go anywhere without your shoes? 24 by 7, except when you're in bed, you always have your shoes on. So you're addicted to your shoes. This is terrible. You must, we must all give up the shoes and learn to walk where, does that make any sense? It doesn't. So, uh, we overreact to the dangers of technology. Of course, there are dangers. It's not as though there are no dangers at all. The biggest danger, according to me, is of leaving a single child alone with the internet. That must be avoided. Uh, it is asking for trouble. Unfortunately, the way the devices are structured and the way families are structured today, that happens all the time. Go to your room. And what's in the room? The internet. Trouble. I would say, where is your television, the big television? It's always in the living room and it's a big screen. Get another big screen next to it and put the internet on that, high-speed internet. And let that be the internet in the house, not tiny devices. And you'll find that what the internet does will be completely different. The screens are too small. We must have big screens. A way to project your little screen onto a big one. If everybody could see what you're doing on your phone, will you do anything bad? <laughs> okay. So when teachers complain, oh, you know, he is sitting in the classroom and chatting with his friends because nobody can see that he is doing it. If everybody could see it, no problem. So public visibility, public use of the internet is I think the key to this whole thing. What was education, traditional education designed for? It was designed for a time when you couldn't carry your library and your teachers with you all your life. So for 17 years, we would put things into your head and then say, now go ahead, if you have a problem, use that knowledge. We won't need that anymore because you are carrying everything that billions of people know inside your pocket. So when you have children with 24 by 7 access to the internet, you will, as a teacher, sit in front of 20 children who know everything or who have the capacity to answer anything. What do you do? Well, I have a simple solution. Ask them those big questions to which no one knows the answer. If no one knows the answer, the internet doesn't either. And those are the biggest questions that drive humanity. And you will find that even very little children, particularly little children, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, if you tell them, no one knows the answer to this question, they just sit up and say, yes, I want to know, okay? As opposed to saying, this was answered in 1872, now for the next one hour I will explain to you what the answer was. They don't want to know. So, I think 10 years from today, with 24 by 7 access to the internet, with every human being on the planet interconnected with each other, the ability that the child will need is how to answer questions quickly and accurately and not get away from the truth. These are the abilities that the teachers of that time will need to produce in the children. You cannot teach these skills, but you can help the child to learn these skills. And that I think is what the whole idea of self-organized learning environments is about.